Are you having as much fun doing stand up now that you did when you started? Yes, I have, man, because there's more people at the show. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a lot more fun when they're there for you. Yeah, you know man. I mean? There's no bar, and it's like your audience now. It's like you work your whole life to build your own audience. You know, everybody has their own audience. Yeah. People might say, "Wow, why is that porn star out there doing stand up comedy?" And I'm not because motherfucker, she has her own following. She has a million people that are gonna pay her fucking forty bucks yeah. to see those big titties and try to do stand up comedy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should fuck a president. <laughs> <laughs> Megusta too by Manu Chow from his 2001 album Proxima Estacion Esperanza. It's also number 474 out of 500 on the 500 with Josh Adam Myers. What's up, everybody? Fleece Army. How are you? It is me, your commander, and Fleece, J-Mo, Josh, Adam, Myers. That's my name. I said it twice. Why not? Thank you for joining me on the podcast where each week me and a guest are going through Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. Hope you paid for your Spotify because the album that we had this week, I don't think any of you guys own it. Thank you to everybody doing the Instagram stories. Uh, I've said it once. I'm going to say it again. Please keep doing it, guys. Take a screenshot of how you're listening to the 500, and I want you to post it on your Instagram stories. Tag me at Josh Adam Myers and hashtag the 500 podcast. Give me a 24-hour ad on your social media. I'm trying to get the word out. I appreciate it. I mean it. I love you. Please do it. First things first, we have to address that my voice is rough and ragged. I sound like I gargled even more rocks this week because I just got back from the Moon Tower Comedy Festival in Austin, Texas, where I did a live 500 taping. And I'm telling you guys, I cannot wait for you to listen to this. We did Def Leppard Hysteria. Little out of order, but well worth it. Huge thanks to Big J Okerson, to the Sklar Brothers. Huge thanks to Pete, the editor, and Jeremiah Tittle, my producer, for coming out to help out with the recording. Also, a big ups to my boys, David and Morty, for helping me come up with the questions. Guys, it was the time of my life. You are going to fucking love this episode. I put three of the funniest people and one of the funniest albums together, and I'm telling you, man, it's magic. Also, I have to give an enormous thanks to Colleen and Lisa for for uh, including uh, me and the goddamn Comedy Jam and the 500 all into your wonderful festival. If you've never been to the Moon Tower Comedy Festival, go. It is comic and fan perfection. If you love comedy, you love hanging out with comics, you want to see some of the best comics working today, go to the Moon Tower Comedy Festival. Mwah! From the from the entire Fleece Army, I love everybody that works for that incredible festival in Austin, Texas. And uh, that's why my voice is trash. Also, we did three goddamn comedy jams that were probably three of the most fun shows I've ever done in my life. That show is fucking beautiful. If you've never been to that, I'm telling you. We've got one at the Roxy May 13th with Bill Burr and Jeff Ross and Maj Dabrani and Jackie Tone and Joe Sib. And it's going to be fantastic. So if you're out in L.A., you better fucking get to that goddamn show. All right. Today in music, for May 1st, which is today, in 2013, Chris Kelly of the rap duo Chris Cross dies at age 34 after overdosing on heroin and cocaine. The duo were teenagers when they had their first number one hit jump in 1992. I remember when that came out. Dude, I fucking, I, like, I wasn't a huge Chris Cross fan like I like I like to jump how can you not it was so catchy but but I was just such a follower back then that that I remember like all the black guys were wearing 
you know, their clothes backwards. And I was like, all right, I guess that's what I'm doing now because I want to be cool with Tyrone Trammell. And I started doing that. God, what was wrong with me? I always remember this day that I took, I was such a little headbanger growing up, man. Such a little headbanger. I mean, Iron Maiden posters, Guns N' Roses posters, a RoboCop poster because RoboCop is the most rock and roll motherfucker fucking robot cop in the world. But I remember the day that I was like, you know what? I want, I like hip hop and I'm done with rock. I remember I did this. I took all my t-shirts and all my, my, my heavy metal tapes because there were tapes back then. And I went over to Ryan McLaughlin's house and I knocked on the door and I was like, Ryan? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, take these. And he's like, but these are, these are all your tapes. And I go, I know. I'm a public enemy fan now. And then I turned and walked away. <laughs> oh, Chris, I really like Jump. That's the only song I know about you, brother. But you know what? May you rest in power. My guest this week is comedian, podcaster, and overall super hilarious dude, Felipe Esparza. You know him from his HBO special, Translate This, that just came out. What's Up Fool podcast on all things comedy. And he also won Last Comic Standing. Felipe is an incredible comedian, an extremely interesting guy whose life story is mind-boggling. So to be able to sit down and talk to him about this record and compare that to his life was a beautiful thing. And to have such an interesting guest, we have to have an interesting artist. Now, while never reaching much mainstream popularity in the U.S., multilingual French musician Manu Chao is a superstar in Europe and Latin America. Chao grew up the child of immigrants who were unwelcome minorities in their homeland. He was born in France to a Galatian father and Basque mother who were both living in exile from military dictator Francisco Franco's Spain. Chow started as a punk rocker in the 80s and 90s bands Los Creos and the more popular Manu Negra. After their breakup, Chow assembled a multicultural group of musicians for his solo band Radio Bemba Sound System which combined extreme leftist political ideologies with diverse musical styles and instrumentation. Now this is Manu's second album, and the title stands for Next Station Hope, and that's a reference to a stop on the Madrid-Spain transit system. This is an incredible album that crept up on me. Didn't think I was going to like it. And man, oh man, do I want to keep listening to it. It sucks that I have to put some of these records down sometimes and pick up another one because I still want to keep fucking with this. Don't forget to listen to the end of the podcast where we're going to spotlight a new artist that is directly influenced by Manu Chao. Also, do the things that you need to do. Rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe to The 500, guys. Get the word out. Tell your friends. Tell everybody how dope this shit is. Follow me on social media at Josh Adam Myers and email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com. And for all things 500, go to our website, the 500 podcast.com. Everything's there. Go there. Beware. No beware. Just go there. It's fun. So with that being said, nothing left to do but say, here we go. With number 474 out of 500, with Proxima Estacion Esperanza by Manu Chao. Felipe Esparza, boom, 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 boom. Felipe Esparza, boom, boom. What's up, fool? <laughs> What's up, dude? All right, so tell me, tell me how, because when I brought up Manu Chow to you, like you immediately, like, oh, I fucking know this. I've been listening to this guy forever. How did you get into Manu? Um, I think it was in um, 1999 or 1998. I had a Volvo. I was living in um, Frogtown, right there on Fletcher and Riverside Drive by the A and PM. Yeah. And I had a Volvo 
And I just started smoking weed again. I have not smoked weed in like uh, since high school. And um, and the song was playing either on KCRW or somewhere, you know. But it was never it was playing on the radio. And it was that song, um, "Me Gustas, tu, Me Gustas Tu." Off this record. Yeah, and I, I never heard that song before. And uh, we were all high in the car. Oh, this song's badass. You know, because you listen to a lot of rap songs, you know, and they're all mainstream, you know, and they want to sell records. You know, they want, like, Midwest people to like it or else they don't feel successful. And there was this guy, you know, who um, who writes, who doesn't even give a fuck, you know. If you like it, you like it. you don't, you don't. And I, I like this guy. And that was your first experience with yeah. him? Yeah. This is mine. I've never, I'd never heard of him. Uh, I and, know, man. I, and then I found out he was in like like a pop band before he was like his own band. Yeah, he was in a band called Mano Negra, Mano Negra, Mano Negra, Mano Negra yeah. and another band called Los Correos. Yeah, Los Correos. So after their breakup, he assembled the multicultural group of musicians for this his solo records, Radio Bemba Sound System, which combined the extreme leftist political <laughs> ideologies with diverse musical styles and instrumentation. And I had I had heard the name, yet I had never heard him, his music. Maybe I was on in the background. But to find out that he is one of the biggest artists in the world. Uh, in Mexico City, he plays to audiences in size of 100,000. Wow. And in France, and his, his, his masterpiece album, Clandestino, is one of the biggest... Best-selling albums of all time. It sold more than three million copies, as did its follow-up, which is our record. And I'll just get into that. Our album is number four seventy-four out of five hundred. It's the second studio album by Manu Chao, Proxima Estación Esperanza, released on June fifth, two thousand and one. Produced by Renaud Letang. So tell me about you, what, what was going on in your life the first time you heard this album. Nothing, man. Nothing. <clears throat> I was just a comic. Um, I, I wasn't. I was touring, but like I was on a, a show called Que Locos. It was produced by Mike Robles. It was, Mike Robles had a comedy show in um, New York City. Like it was like, um, not, not you know. I don't know if they do that anymore. You know because of Dish Network, but local access. Yeah, they they still do that a little bit. Yeah, local I mean, access. So that show laughs. Yeah, he had <laughs> a show called it. Comedy Picante. And he did it like, in, I think Caroline's, they would give him like the midnight show. And he'll put up like a lot of Latino acts. And um, somehow they liked it. And Galavision was a Spanish network. They compete with Telemundo. So this, they did uh, something no one else ever done. They put an English show on their network. Huh. And I was on it. And uh, that's what's going on with me. I was making money, a little bit of money. We went on a little tour. Yeah. You know, and um, it was Gabriel Iglesias, myself. Sometimes Willie Barsena, Carlos Oscar, just a bunch of Latinos sh- that were on the show. And it was cool, man. How far before Last Comic Standing is that? Woo! <laughs> Long, Long time. time ago, man. I would say 10 years. So what's going on in More your life? More than 10 are you, years. Are you a broke, struggling comedian at that time, just trying to get by? Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I was making, like, nothing. But I, 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 bond, I had a cheap apartment, so I stood there forever yeah. without them moving me. So I made I made them kick me out. And, <laughs> well, um, you squatted until the end. Bro, I, I was living in uh, in Frogtown. It does. Uh, if um, on the city, it's called Elysian Valley, but the neighborhood, the gang is Frogtown. That I, I live like a block away from where Emilio Rivera lived. You know, from Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. Like he still lived in the neighborhood when I was there. Yeah. He was a struggling actor. Yeah. And um, I would see him, and he he lived like in one apartment, and then. He became more successful like, on Sons of Anarchy. And he ended up owning the four houses in his yard. Like, he started off living with his mom and dad on one yard. And then, like, those back houses, he ended up buying all of them. Really? Yeah. And I was living in a studio, okay? I was paying um, four ninety five a month. Oh, God. I used to have a place, like, a block away from here with Byron Bowers where I paid 500 a month. Oh, it was the best. All right, so what? tell me, how did you feel about this record when you first heard it? Oh, when I heard it, when I first heard it, like it spoke to me, you know, because I, I'm, you know, I'm Latino, I'm Mexican, you know, um, there wasn't that many Spanish songs I really like, you know, unless they were um, with accordion, you know, or they were narco, narco, 
Not cool. What they call that shit? So like the yeah, the narco music. I yeah. remember when I used to DJ at the strip club, and, yeah. the, and the narco drug dealers would come in the day, and they'd be like, "Yo, put on this," and it was yeah. just like heavy accordion, like fucking, like it would kill the mood in the strip club. But they would start throwing money, and I remember I get yelled at by my boss because it was just very like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if I felt like I heard this before, right? I'm like, yeah. I must have heard it before, but I don't know who it was. And um, when I heard it, I, I, I didn't have a. I couldn't like Google it, you know, or wait, there was or, nothing or, back then. You couldn't sound, I sound. Couldn't, no, I couldn't, no. man. So once it was gone, it was gone. I never heard it again. So yeah. how did how are you getting back into it? Is this like the first time you no, listen to it? In no, forever, uh, or just I found out later on by um by somebody who, who that was, and I went to go the Virgin Records across the street from the Laugh Factory. Oh yeah, dude, that was my iTunes. <laughs> so that was my um. I would go there, man. Are you so going there and be like, there's a song that goes, Me que corazón, yeah. mi corazón. I go be to like, the Spanish <laughs> section, alternative music. Yeah. And um, I had a spot like at one. So we get like totally annihilated, you know. We killed like three hours and uh, they close at midnight. That was the best. My spot was a one. And um, I would listen to the Manu Chao. That song, Me Gusta. Plus another, there was another song too um, from another album, another album called Bongo. Bongo Bongo. Bongo that's Bongo. yeah. It's if 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 I'm not mistaken, it's that's the recycling of. Uh, he's using this, band. Yeah, he's using the same music. That's and I think that is what. That's what I like with this album. Other songs sound the same, but they don't sound the same. Well, actually, it's like um, they this it's like when you write a, like when I write a joke, you know, mm-hmm. I write a joke, then I write rewrite it ten times, and I see the joke the same joke over and over throughout the set. Yeah. And that's why pretty much you corner the market on that joke. Yeah, well, that's what I that's what I think is 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 perfect about this record because for me, I had like I said, I had never heard his music. I heard the name. Yeah. So when I put this on, I was expecting what you were saying. I was expecting that narco music. I was expecting like very salsa heavy. Yeah. No idea it was going to be any oh, form reggaeton. of. I had no idea it was going to yeah. be re- reggae reggaeton because it's it's a mixture of everything. everything. And the thing that you said is what I think is a perfect way to describe this record because I loved this record so much. I felt like every song felt like it was a part of one big whole and it was more of a Spanish reggae symphony than an album. Yeah. Everything flowed into everything, whether it was the the voiceover at the beginning, whether it was the the continuation of one song into the next from, I think, La Proxima, into is that the song the yeah, the one La, that's right before me uh me gusta too la primavera then then goes into la proxima yeah then then goes into me gustas too me gusta and too. it was just a perfect rec dude i could i found myself as i was listening to this record dancing 90 percent of the time i can't dance for shit unless it's like rave style dancing so let's jump into the record because yeah. what i thought was very interesting about this since i've never heard it this record was nominated for a Grammy uh, for Best Latin Rock Alternative Performance. And I love that because this who is... Who they up against? I don't know who was up against. I could find out. We'll find out. Probably Mana. There was Mana around uh, yeah. back then? Yeah. Mana's like the only real like Mexican or like Latino like artist that I know. I know. I mean, that is like rock. There's like, what, Gypsy Kings? Would you yeah, put this up there with Gypsy Kings? No, is Gypsy Manu- Kings, they're Spain. They're Spanish. They're very Greek. They do the they do the Coach of California. Oh yeah, dude. That's so good. Alright, let's jump into the record. So the first song is Mary Blues. Uh this is an incredible song. Peter, play a minute one forty eight seconds in. Play it. Near as I can figure out, this song is a sad song about missing his lady, but it's called Mary Blues, so it has this happy feel. So I read that when you were younger, you had been in a rehab, and you had been asked for five things that you wanted out of life. And two of those were to be a stand-up comedian and to be happy. Yes. Why stand-up? Oh, because I always wanted to be a comedian since I was a little kid. I used to listen to Dr. Demento on... KMT, KLOS, from 7 to 9 p.m. It was a, a comedy show that was on every Sunday. 
and I was like, um, he would play cuts of George Carlin, Bill Cosby, and um, Cheech and Chong. Yeah. And funny ass song from by Weird Al Yankovic, and um, musical musical Mike, some guy that just did music with his hands. So oh, I, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they were like fart sounds. Whimsical Will. Yeah, and um, Dr. Demento. That's why I wouldn't want to be a comedian. I wasn't the funniest guy in the class, but I, I like stand up comedy. So, how did you make that transition from troubled youth into stand up comedy? I don't know, man. I was coming home one day, and there were these, like, these guys from the neighborhood. This, you know, the gang was like this guy, Four Street Flats, I guess, and um, and there were these bloods. They were they were like, they were allies, you know. They were hanging out together, and uh, they were listening to Eddie Murphy, Delirious, and drinking forty ounces, and smoking weed and selling dope. Like these guys were listening to Eddie Murphy, man. They were not listening to no um, no fucking um, Art LeBeau, Oldies but Goodies show. No K Earth One with Huggy Boy, no K Rock with Kevin and Bean, no no Casey Case from Top Forty. They were listening to fucking Eddie Murphy, man. Yeah. Somebody bought a fuck. Somebody went into a, a Music Plus store, actually went in there, asked for Eddie Murphy Delirious, brought it home, and told these motherfuckers play this shit. <laughs> Turn off Nucleus Jam on it. You know what I mean? So when I saw that, you know, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be that comedian that. People from the hood respect, you know? Yeah. How long did that take? I mean, from the transition, from when you said that to actually do starting stand-up? Ooh, probably eight years, because I, like I was like junior high, junior high school. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, because this being that this song is a contradiction where it's, it's uh, dep- sad lyrics over basically a happy song. What about the act of getting on stage and exposing your deepest insecurities brings you joy and happiness? Basically oh, revealing yourself. Oh, yeah, man. I reveal more about me on stage about my real life than I do in person. And when I say it on stage, it's so hilarious. Like, I have a joke where I say that, um, whatever. You know, and I say, man, I can never have sex like that. I have a plan to fast the eyelids. I want to eat a tennis <laughs> I want you to fucking be laying on a tennis ball. They can't even be a dog around. What if the fucking dog team a tennis ball? <laughs> then my foot starts hurting again. <laughs> you know, but I would never tell that to a, even a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were talking about that you wanted to be happy as well when you were le- when you were in that program. So how have you done with the happiness part? I, I think I've always been happy, but I, I like, like I grew up in a neighborhood. You know, it was a tough neighborhood, but it was you know if, if people are saying oh, I'll never live there, but you know if you don't have a choice, you know the bad neighborhood becomes a part of you. You know, like it's like. It's like you're you're now part of the leaves of this tree. Yeah, you know, you might fall, some fall off, you know, some bloom, you know, some flower, some stay there. But um, I was it became like my neighborhood was bad, dude. Like, like my neighbors next door were selling cr- um, PCP. Yeah, you know, and then they and then they later on sold crack, and they were always fighting, and uh, but they they never bothered us. How old are you while you're living there? 12, 12 10, years old. 8 years yeah. old. So you're seeing like you're seeing crackheads run around, you're seeing people Some people get shot. Yeah. Well, I don't see people get shot. I seen people that were shot already. That were laying laying on the floor. So but but um I I wasn't even happy then, you know? You, you were happy then. Cuz I don't you don't Well, you don't know. It's you just that's know. what you that's what you've grown you, up you, with. You, yeah. You didn't grow, but then now like, but now that I'm I'm a different type of happy now, you know, because now I have dreams about that. And I and I asked some people that grew up there, do you have those dreams too? Then I spoke to another person. So we're shell shocked, bro. Like being in Vietnam. Yeah, so you have like PTSD from yeah. it. So like so how so your definition of happiness has changed since you wrote that list. Like what makes you happy now? Going up every night, you know, I left I love standing up comedy. I love like creating, you know, like when a new when a new job works, yeah, I've been doing it for like twenty three years, twenty four, twenty three, yeah. and I still get joy out of it. You know, there's nothing else I like doing. Are you having as much fun doing stand up now that you did when you started? Yes, I have, man, because there's more people at the show. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a lot more fun when they're there for you. Yeah, you know man, I mean? there's no bar, and it's like your audience now. It's like you work your whole life to build your own audience. You know, everybody has their own audience. 
Yeah. People might say, wow, why is that porn star out there doing stand-up comedy? And I'm not. Because, motherfucker, she has her own following. She has a million people that are going to pay her fucking 40 bucks yeah. to see those big titties and try to do stand-up comedy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should fuck a president. <laughs> he pays. Yeah. He pays he money to back. shut you up. Yeah. All right. Well, that song then goes into Bixo. Uh, Peter, play the intro for this song. Radio Bemba, zero, zero. I used to go to this, this um, do comedy. Yeah. And this fucking um this fucking coffee shop right there by MacArthur Park back yeah. in the days. Instead of a hotel, they always they would always play Mano Chao, and I remember this song. This song is so fucking catchy. I had my first sorriso, sorriso and potato potato burritos. Really? Yeah, at that place, and this song was playing. I mean, it's definitely something that I want to hear while I'm eating something but made of soy. Sometimes when I would hear, when I would hear Mano Chao, <laughs> and I would hear the people that liked it, you know, I, I kind of didn't like put like why are these people like he's so he's so pretentious, you know. Who, Manu is pretentious? No, but the people, some people at the coffee house that were listening to it. They were pretentious. Yeah. No, I could definitely and see that. You didn't that. even say hello when I came in, but you, here, you, here you are listening to the music about happiness. Yeah. Well, I think it's. I think maybe they, they felt like Manu was definitely a, more of an artist than some of the other people. I mean, listen, the guy in this song <clears throat> is speaking Galeo, uh, which I think is a mixture of French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's, he just came off the first song, which is like, that's basically like you said, it's like slow and low reggae. And then it goes into what, I don't even know what I would, what the type of music I would call this. It's a combination of like bachata. I don't even know if that's right. Is it? Yeah, bachata. Is it a combination of bachata? I just remember like when I. A I, little bit of bachata, not too much. Well, from the various translations, we found this is either about head lice or the sound of of bass or literally a coconut bug that gets into the singer's head and fucks him up. All right, let me ask you this. What gets in your head these days and becomes impossible to get out? Bad shit I did it in my life. Really? You, you sit in that a lot? No, not, not a lot, but sometimes, you know, like um, like I was, I was saying earlier, you know, like I grew up in a neighborhood where, where people got a lot of a lot of people like got dealt like bad chips, bad cards, or bad karma, or or bad things always happen to this person. Yeah. So, so um, they know how to act to bad things, you know. Like, oh, they start, they get sad. So, I know a lot of people in my neighborhood that grew, I grew up with, whenever good shit happens, they also feel sad. That they don't know how to feel happy. Like they start crying. They need to step away from the people and ball. Yeah. <sighs> and I'm that type of person. So when you 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 sit back, think about the past, and and get emotional. Yeah, I have, or like some people, I don't really have it, but a lot of people have that um, survivor's guilt. Like, oh, I made it, but this motherfucker in a wheelchair got shot up. Is still living in a neighborhood. No, know? I understand. I mean, listen. I mean, tragic things has happened to a lot of us, and I mean, I was the same way where I would just sit and just think about. Losing my friend yeah. or the 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 shit I did to my parents when I was younger and I was a bad kid, but uh, for real, I, 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 you, me too, man. I think about the bad shit like um, I did, I did with my parents, you know, like trust and you know most of the trust, you know, like how do you get that back, you know? Well, do you have you apologized for any of the shit that you've done? Yeah, because that definitely helps. It's like just saying just saying I'm sorry. I had to say it to my parents. But I feel like they owe me a sorry too. Probably. Yeah. There's a lot of people that need to apologize yeah. that, that feel like they're too proud to do it. But, I mean, if that's something that gets in your head, for me, because that's that was the last 37 years of my life was dealing with every bad thing that I'd ever done and just letting it ruin me and, and my future. Yeah. And then about a year and a half ago, I made this change. I started meditating. I started taking care of myself. And from that point on, it's like you can't you can't change the past. You know what I mean? You can't change it. It happened. It but happened. what you but what you can do is just say it's okay because it got you to a really good place, man. You know. Yeah, man. Definitely. That song then kicks in to El Dorado, nineteen ninety seven. Play the horns when it kicks in, Peter. <laughs> I love 
That's ska. Is that ska? Yeah. That's ska music. I, yeah. See, I would have thought this is more of like a yeah. salsa feel because no. it's just, it's the way that yeah, I like fucking you, hear it. Like, I feel it, dude. A, I feel it. a little rock steady beat behind it. Yeah. It makes it ska. Well, it's basically the same song, but a little bit more intense. And then he keeps asking the question, que paso, que paso. And I think this has something to do when we started reading the lyrics with the police murdering some rural Brazilians. Oh, really? Now, there are a lot of repeats of what happened, what happened, hence the que paso, que paso. Now, you, like we were talking about, you grew up in the projects of East L.A. What was your early interaction with the police and violence, and how did it alter your view and value of life? Oh, man, when I was, I was, um, I was like 8 or 20 years old, we were, we were playing baseball at Pecan Park Elementary. Pecan, Pecan Park in uh, Boyle Heights. And um, I, like the the pro, the housing project is surrounded was sur- what back then the, then was surrounded by regular homeowners you know or, or people who rented, so there'll be like two strips of regular streets and that's where the park was, and I was leaving the park, and um, I saw a bunch of people protesting, like they were like um they were communists I found out later, they were all communists, they were wearing all in red like we were like a communist party. They were speaking speaking to the people there, all the gangbangers. And they were trying to get some of the gangbangers to join them. Then they all got crazy, bro. What do you mean crazy? Like a big fucking fight started. Like a big fight. Between the gangbangers and the communists? Yeah. And like and I saw this guy stab this guy a bunch of times, like and uh, he died. And I found out I found out later on when I went to uh, San Francisco, they have like a little museum for um for protesters, whatever, and I looked them up, and and I and I told the guy that, was, that had flyers, and I said, "Hey man, I was there when that happened. I wanted to say that it didn't happen the way you say it, but I was there." Yeah, because the guy was saying that he was killed by police. Bullshit! I saw the guy. Um, maybe the police didn't intervene. That's true. Yeah, the police didn't show up, you know, and the culprits got away. And they arrested all the communists. But, you know, back then, I don't know, politics, you know. But the guy whose name was David. His name was David um, David something, you know. He was half white, half Mexican, I guess. Mm-hmm. But that fool got re- stabbed repeatedly, man. Like, And um, the next day I went to school, right? I went to school. And it was still like a, like a puddle of blood. And I saw a girl, a girl that was part of the group, some white chick. And um, I guess she got released. But yeah, man, it was fucking crazy. So I, I, I fucking ride my bike to the other side of the projects. I'm at the liquor store. I'm buying a hot dog, you know, from the fucking liquor store, the one that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 7 <laughs> Eleven on that little spinny thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my friend was playing Dig Dug, you know. Dig Dug's a shit, dude. And, um, and the fool that was, like, got stabbed, he was standing right there. And there was this, this, this black dude named um, Lamont Repos. He was like an older kid, 16 years old. And he rode a bike. He goes, man, that, you got what happened over there? They stabbed somebody, man. The police are coming. And then I'm like, fuck, okay. The guy who's stabbing us right here by the beer, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he just one day after getting stabbed, he's like, I need my drink to, and then, um, to heal this the pain. The police all went over there, man. But So how was your... Like, so, that so, was nuts. So violence, you saw, you started seeing violence at a young age from where you grew up. But how, did, how was your interactions with the police? Fuck the police, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's my attitude. So I grew up in a neighborhood, and I talk about it in my bits, that um, if you grew up where I grew up, if you grew up in a bad neighborhood or you grew up in an apartment or wherever, um, not the suburb, wherever the police, you saw the police all the time. Like, they were part of your life. Like, police contact every, every single day. Because I grew up in the housing projects, right? We had housing police, too. Really? So with so security we had guards or actual police? Actual police with guns, shotguns. They could arrest people in the housing projects and take them to jail. So we had those guys all day till three in the morning, and they would leave, and then come back at eight in the morning. So, so shit was going down from three to eight. Then they yeah, just like just... I will come out and start selling my dope again <laughs> <laughs> in the presence of everybody. I don't have to hide anymore. But um, and then the LAPD will show up. Then I remember one time the LAPD, they were like. 15 deep, and they those motherfuckers they walked from Anderson by the 101 freeway all the way 
to the 60 freeway on 6th Street where I grew up. I know up. where that is, yeah. That's a long walk. A Pretty long much walk. a Gestapo patrol. You know, just walking and harassing people. The crash unit. So my, I talk about it on stage now. I said, if you grew up in a neighborhood, like a bad neighborhood, no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're doing a, being a good person, a good Samaritan, doing good, you're always going to acknowledge the police presence nearby. Yeah. Like, if the police are passing by, you're going to be like, oh, shit, 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 shut the fuck up. We're doing a podcast. I know, no, no, no. But the police are passing by. They don't pass by. Yeah. I mean, how's your... So that's how, how I grew up. So your view of the police hasn't changed. It's still basically the same. No, man. I, 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 I like, I, blue lights matter. You know, everybody matters. But... um. I still, for some reason, when I see the police, I always say, like, oh, shit, the police is Yeah, do you get your butthole tightened yeah, up? You're yeah, like, fuck, but, uh, dude, what'd I do? But um, <laughs> Me police too. is cool, man. I, per- I perform at police stations. Yeah. All right. Well, that where that song right. ends, promiscuity picks up. And I'm still feeling the exact same vibe, a very, just a little bit more fun. It kind of reminds me of a kid song. Uh, Peter, play uh, 50 Seconds In. Until it drops. That song has everything. It has like everything. It, it, it sounds like a fucking carnival. This song. This song got into my head, dude. And it's like, this is one of the few ones that I just kept singing. What I love about this is some of the lyrics where he says, too much, too much promiscuity can drive you to insanity. Too much, too much insanity can drive you to criminality. And then he goes on with hypocrisy, economy, morality, criminality. Basically, he's asking to be set free from what oh, I'm thinking. Chaos, probably. From yeah. chaos. Well, let's think about it. Like, with sex, this is like a basic dirty little ditty that sounds like this cartoon with a baby duck on it. And it seems to be taking this moral position about how having lots of meaningless sex can lead to danger. But then it sort of turns on how hypocrisy can lead you to something worse. So it's like a deep yeah. sex song, basically. Now... Were you raised with religion? Were your parents very religious? Fuck yeah, man. We had to go to our cat. We went to catechism on Saturday, church on Sunday. Yeah. We had to do our first communion, our our confirmation, our what else? Baptize. And then there's some other stuff I don't even know about. Were your parents strict? Yeah, they were strict. I had mo- both parents growing up. Yeah. Now we had to go to church every sun- fucking Sunday, man. With, what would so they were what were they strict about? Going to church, just just going to church. Everything else sell dope. They were fine with, but just no. My, my parents didn't know. I didn't, I didn't do none of those. I did all those things after I was eighteen years old. So, so what? But were when you... I was a good kid, like we had to go in before when the lights were when the street lights went on. Yeah. We had to in before, been in the house before six. We had to eat dinner together. We had to eat breakfast together. Yeah. So we had a lot of quality time, like th- those type of things. But um, on the on the outside, you know, like I was crazy, motherfucker, bro. I mean. There was nothing else to do, man. We lived, we lived in near the warehouses. Like that was my backyard, man. Like, like all those, all those places that are lost now. Yeah, there was fucking people working there when I was when I was a kid. <laughs> and um, I would go over there, man, in the summertime. There was a place where they had a bunch of watermelons, and the watermelons were good, but they would throw rotten ones away. <clears throat> and I would fucking cut the watermelons in half and sell the motherfuckers, bro. <laughs> I will go in there, bro, that and I will cut that watermelon, bro, and sell that shit for a dollar. Fuck and yeah. I'll fill up a little shopping cart with 30 of them. And me and this homegirl named Rosa, yeah. she was like a Sam lesbian. Rosa. And her and I, when nobody was looking, I would tell her, Grinder, Grinder. <laughs> she was like my, she would do the crazy shit that I would tell her to do. And she'll go in there, bro, and grab a bunch of watermelons and throw them in a trash can. And then um, we would put good ones inside the fucking shopping cart yeah. to show people that they're all good. <laughs> the, the I made so switch. much money one summer. I bought all my little brother's school shoes. 
Really? Yeah, man. From Sal and Malin. They weren't Jordan, but they were ponies. <laughs> Dude, I'm going to tell you they right now. They were kids. <laughs> that, that might be my favorite expression I've ever said in my life. For, for Sal and Malin. You're, come on, bro. Don't sell drugs. Sal and Malin. Sal and Malin, y'all. All right. Well, so, so your parents were strict. So what were the moral codes at home? I mean, did they teach Don't jerk you? off. No. Nah. I don't know, man. <laughs> don't jerk off? Don't, nah, don't fuck with all the religions, I guess. <laughs> don't question God. Don't question why the Virgin Mary got pregnant and nobody saw you know, stuff like that. Don't question why the dinosaurs are here. You know, stuff like my, my parents are hardcore Catholic, man. So let me ask you, but despite... Oh, oh but, don't get divorced, even though, you get, even though you beat up your wife every night. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Despite that upbringing, though, you became a father as a teenager, right? Oh, yeah, man. Food get horny. <laughs> so how did that go down with your family, like, considering they were so... Oh, my mom, like a typical mom, she said, uh, don't bring that kid around here. You know, she was all mad. Really? You ruined my life. I said, well, your grandma at 30? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how old were you when that happened? 17. You were 17. So how was that to be growing up at the same time as raising a child? Um, it was, t- well, you don't, you don't think about these things, what would have happened, you know. As an adult, you think about them now because, you know, you know that, you know that that's, that's horrible, you know. Yeah. But, but while it's happening, it's, it's happening, bro. There's nothing you can do about it, man. Yeah. It's like you're in a roller coaster and going straight down. Yeah, and nobody stopping you. There's no advice. Nobody gave me advice. Nobody. St- I had. I had nobody who who told me, "Hey, man, I've been through this shit, man." Or no, nobody even sat her down and said, "You know what? We're gonna watch this baby, and you're gonna still go to school." Nah, man, you're a fucking loser. Was, which is the the wrong way to do it. But they should have dealt with it differently. Like, sat us both down. Listen, we're gonna watch this baby. You guys gonna still, You guys gonna still go to go to school, go to college. Yeah, do everything. Don't fucking, this is not going to stop you from moving on, but it did. What did you learn during that time, though? No shit, man. No. <laughs> Got more chicks pregnant, bro, after that. Really? Never pulled out? Bro, for what? It feels too good. <laughs> no, they don't, you know, we're Catholic, bro. They don't, they don't tell you about condoms in Catholic school. Really? No, hell no. They're Why not? not? Because they don't. Because but- you got you to gotta keep bringing up more. You gotta fucking start raising. They, they want to add more army to the Catholic more army, Church, bro. Dude. More actually, more money to for the Vatican. Yeah, all right. But they don't practice. We don't. They don't believe in abortion, bro. Like Mexicans, like as far as anybody goes, man, we're the most conservative people. Like we we fucking don't believe in abortion, and we buy Chevrolet. Really? Like every Mexican out there has a Chevrolet. Impala, all the lowrider scene, they're all Chevrolets. Really? Fords. <laughs> You I love it. You call it Chevrolet. It's uh, it's you're not you don't go like the Chevrolet. I like how you're doing it. Chevrolet, Ch- bro. Chevrolet, selling melon and a Chevrolet. Chevrolet. You ever fucking a Chevrolet? Yeah, bro. A Ford Granada, <laughs> a Ford Door. I bought that shit for two hundred dollars. Was it comfortable? Hell yeah, bro. I bought it for two hundred dollars. Because it's a Chevrolet. Yeah, fuck yeah, dude. With a Ford Granada. All right, now we're into the song we were talking about earlier, La Primavera, which translates to spring. This is such a good song. Peter, play the opening. Such a fucking good song. Uh, the guitar riff in this is sick. Just that little guitar picking. I love the uh, when they at the end when they're like, bomba la bomba la bomba la bomba la bomba la bomba la bomba la. Que hora son mi corazón? Boom boom boom. Just a song about Manu asking what time it is in different locations. But man, is this a good fucking song, dude? Uh, so this it's a, he sang it in Spanish. This translates to the spring, but in this case, it seems to mean the disappointment upon finding out that the promised hope of a new political leader turned out to be more of the same. So, so we're pretty much asking, like, uh, like um, you know what time it is? Yes. You know when black people, you know what time it is? Yeah. So pretty much saying he's singing it to them. What time it is? 
what time it is in Tijuana. And they're pretty much telling him to stay alert. Yeah, well, so he, listen, he sings, nos, I'm going to say this wrong, nos en, engañaron con la primavera. They, part, they, 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 they are mistaken us. They cheated us with spring. Screen. So when Manu was at a concert in Brooklyn, he said, this song is talking about all these fucking politicians saying to us lies, lies and more lies. They try to explain to us what we need to fight violence with violence. They try to fight terrorism with more terrorism. And they want to fight terrorists with Guantanamos. I think I said that right. The only (laughs) the only way to fight violence is with education, food and understanding. So it's that basically he's saying our government lies to us nonstop. So you came to America as a young immigrant. If you can remember, what were your experiences with the bureaucracy of the immigration process? Man, none. Really? I was too little. You don't remember any of it? None. Like, like whatever people are going through here, I mean, I don't even know, man. There was no social media, so I never heard of anything. What's your have your parents have you talked to your parents about their their experience with uh, with immigration to America? No, nah, I don't. I don't talk to my parents about anything. We're not even that close, really. Like my parents are not the kind of parents you go there for problems. Then you go there to get whipped or cry or eat. Yeah, yeah. So even to this day, my dad has not said I'm proud of you, and I'm and I've accomplished a lot of shit in my life. Dude, you accomplished a lot of shit in your life. You yeah. need to be proud of you. Yeah, I am. You should be very proud of yourself because what you've been through is fucking incredible. And like you were talking about that, how the past, it's like the past is what made you this dope. Yeah, man. It's what made you the person that you are. So, so, but at four years old, did you have an image of what America was going to be like? No, man. We have no idea where we're going. We're just being led. And the first city we went to was Carson, Carson, California. It was like a Home Depot for a bunch of um, illegal immigrants. <laughs> yeah. It was like the, I guess it was like um, the hub. The hub. Where everybody was going to go to different places. Okay, you're going to go to Nashville. <laughs> you're going to go to fucking Chicago. <laughs> you're going to go to East LA. And you're going to go to Boyle Heights. And I went to Boyle Heights. You went to Boyle Heights. All right. Well, how is your perception of America now? Best country to live in. I've been here all my life. Yeah. If you ever go to, if you ever go to war in Mexico, I'll be on this side. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what, should, I'll what, be a spy, bro. What is your relationship? I will, let, I will show America how to sneak into Mexico. <laughs> how do you do it? What do you? What's the? What's the? You know, people way? say it's tough. People think that it's tough to like sneak into America. It is tougher to sneak into Mexico. I really? mean, it is tough. You can, like ask any American out here. I, I know. I, I've known Americans who like who, who in Texas. Like I know the crazy ass white boy in Corpus Christi. I think his name is John. <laughs> and he speaks good Spanish. He's in a one of those banda bands. He plays drums. Yeah. He's the only white boy in the band, bro. He just plays drums. He has the same goofy ass outfit and the fucking, you know, beads and all that shit. He lived in Mexico City. He was fucking uh, giving illegal Mayan tours. <laughs> illegal Mayan tours. Yes. How is that possible? You just doesn't have a permit? Or no just- permit. He's grabbing people from downtown and driving them out to the ruins. Yeah. And giving this fucking fake ass tour. <laughs> this was created in. He was deported, bro. For, they he, sent that fool back. From America back to Mexico? From Mexico back to America. Really? <laughs> it's the you have no visa. They expired and they shipped them, bro. Really? Fast. No waiting in line. No processing. Just get out of here. Yeah. Well, let me ask you because of this. So, what's your relationship now with Mexico? I, I man, I, I don't, I don't go over there, man. I, I don't. I mean, I, I have no business over there. All my family is here. The people that I know that live over there, I don't even know. Yeah. All my mom's family is over there, but um, I like to go to Mexico City because it's beautiful. I mean, it's bigger than New York City. A lot of my friends have been there and, and they don't stand up comedy. And I want to go there. I want to go to the. I want to go to see those Mayan temples. Yeah. I want to go to Tulum. I heard it's a beautiful place. T A L U M Tulum, and um, that's one of the first places where um, pirates were. Really. Back in the day, I read a I read a pirate book, and um, a lot of the whatever trade, slave trade, gold trade, whatever trade was started. It wasn't started there, but. It, it, part of it was there in Tulum. Okay. And it still has, it still looks the same way as it looked back then. Really? I've only been to Cabo San Lucas, and uh, 
as I as I, as people know from the podcast, I got hit by a car uh, while Whoa. I was at the airport. Yeah, dropping off the Kardashian sisters uh, when I was working on their TV show, and and the day prior to that, I got busted with cocaine at the Cabo Wabo. Um, Fuck. Yeah, and I remember I remember they. Uh, they, uh, I, this guy jumped over the bathroom stall. I dropped the bag of coke in the bathroom in the toilet, and then they throw me out to the dude. How they catch you? I, I don't know. There was like eight people at the Cabo Wabo, dude. It was like me, the people I work with, and then this other table. And I went to the bathroom and I sit down in the toilet because we were all trading the bag. And I'm doing a bump, and then this like four foot eight Mexican dude like climbs over like the toilet barriers. You know what I mean? That blocks in your Damn. little cocoon. Pichy jungle. And, yeah, dude. Is that his name? You know no. him? No. <laughs> and he grabbed me and then threw me to the cops that were already waiting there. So he was a security guard for inside the club. Or for just inside the, blue. the club, yeah. He, I don't know if he was wearing blue, but he was he was definitely the security guard for the club. But yeah. he had a cop like right out front, and they threw me to the cop, and the cop's like, where's the cocaine? Where's the cocaine? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he goes, I was like, he's like, well, what's that white shit on, uh, below your nose? Donuts. And I, I, I was even better. I went, oh, man, that's the salt from the margarita. Come on, man. <laughs> go there. Yeah, dude. Yeah, and, then, and he was like, no, it's cocaine. And you I was like, pay him? yeah, 200 bucks. They let me go. Fuck, Fuck yeah, dude. This song, though, is basically about fighting. What pushes you past reason straight into fight mode? Oh, just the airport, man. Like, cause I travel every week, <laughs> pretty two weeks out of the year. I know what I'm fucking doing. People are slow. They don't know, they don't know anything. Like, I am, I am like, I, I could get in the, I get, I get in the airport fast, man. I am TSA approved. I am clear. I show my ET finger. I pass everybody up. Some people don't even know what that is. They think I'm cutting a line sometimes. I was telling the stupid ass white lady goes, Where is he good to go? I turn around because I'm badass, lady. Are you badass? <laughs> no, all right. <laughs> and then, well, when was the last time you were pushed to the point of either engaging or in considering violence? Has anything happened to you? Oh, man. When I won last comic standing, yeah. I went to his bar. And and then like there was a, there was some comedian there that I that don't like and he don't like me, but he was just there to start shit. You know, yeah. like nobody invited your ass. You know, nobody invited you. How did he approach you? He just I approached him, bro. He was ah. on stage and I just grabbed the microphone away. Really? And I said, man, get the fuck out of here, man. Real comedians right here, bro. You see me with a TV asshole? What the fuck you doing here? Get the fuck out of here. What did he excuse me, what did he do? Cried, bro. Did he really? No, I don't know what he did, but he ended up leaving. <laughs> so he did leave. And that was the last time? Yeah. All right. This this song then is the same song as the next one, Me Gustas Too. This is uh so fucking good. You can't not move when it's on. Peter, just play a little bit of it. I used to cruise to that song, bro. I had a Montero. Dude, it's so it's it's perfect like cruising, cruising bro. music. Cruising it's slow, while you're cruising. low, reggae, reggae tone. Now this is a Did song. Have a chick over playing that song, man. Hell yeah. Really? The uh, the song as well as two other tracks from the same album, La Primavera, and the final song, Infinita Tristanza. Feature the same background music And like I said This song has many elements And melodies from the last song But it takes it From the political To the personal It runs down a list Of all the things he likes And ends each phrase with I like you too Now clearly You're in a loving relationship With your wife And you guys also have A great working relationship yeah. How do you guys Separate business and pleasure? Because she's your manager yeah. So so how, how does that work For the two of you? Good yeah. Um, I guess when we were uh, boyfriend and girlfriend before we were we had the business relationship. You know, like we cut it off. You know, like we turn our phones off. Yeah, she turns her phones off and we just chill, watch forensic files. That's your shit, forensic yeah. files. Yeah, and British shows. What's your favorite British shows? Uh, uh um, 
Shit. Like old school British shows? No, British shows, like reality shows. Like there's a show called Ex- Interior, and they have these three, two, three types of people compete to, in, to fix up the interior of a house. And the way they talk, and there's another one where they cook. Um, the Great British Bake Off? Yes. That's your shit? That's, that, that, that cake is light heavy, isn't dude, it? I can't tell you how many British, not just British shows, but forensic files and like baking shows unite loved ones. Yeah. Like there's something about it. Forensic files in particular, me and my ex-girlfriend used to watch forensic files all the time. And then we used to also watch MasterChef. MasterChef and, and, good. And MasterChef is fucking bomb. So it's something about cooking and murder. Cooking, right? Yeah, I'm cooking, murder, and love. I think it's because, I think it's because, uh, the with the cooking, it's because we're trying to show them how to cook, and then with the murder, it's just to show them. I'll kill you, bitch! I'll kill you, bitch! <laughs> 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 All right, this goes into uh, Dania, oh, the one that just goes. Play, it, Peter, play it with me. Hey, hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah. This is. I love this one. Uh, hey, this is all in Arabic. Hey, and this is what my downstairs neighbor uh, listens to at full blast. She fucking uh, loves this kind of music. Uh, this song is about the Algerian Civil War, which has been going on for nine years at this point and would continue for a year after this song. And to make it simple, there were Islamic factions that disagreed with the way the government was running. Some of them wanted France's influence to be banished and a return to a more traditional Islamic culture. There were also uh, many massacres and the using of civilians to cover, including many children. So, Damn. yeah, I know. You got deep. Up. Yeah, it did get deep. You got deep, cocksucker. Did you listen to the song? Yeah, dude. There's a lot of research I have to do to do this. Now, these days, I when I see the way people react to each other online, it already feels like there's a civil war brewing. Do you think there's a way back to civility without a civil war? I think there's civility already, man. I, I mean, I've been to Birmingham, Alabama. I've been to um, Raleigh, North Carolina. I've been to um, most of all the South. And um, I, I, my comedy has not changed. It's the same wherever I go. There's Mexicans at every show I go to on, of these cities I mentioned and white people. And um, whatever people see on social media, it's only happening in social media. I mean, it's not happening out there in the real world. I think people should just put down their laptop or throw it away and go outside and actually meet people because all these races, all this bickering, it's only happening on the TV. It's only happening on social media. Go out. I, I'm out there, bro. I'm out there. I'm out there in the airports, and it's just a few people. It's not the whole world. I think people are just blinded, you know, by what they what they read. They, they read one bad story, and they get all into it. Like, you know what? There's other good stories, man. Some guy rescued a pet bull from drowning. Go read that instead. Yeah, but people do get caught up in... in you know, the, the, I used to get caught up like that, too. Like, when I first was on Last Comic Standing, that's when I realized, wow, there is still racist people. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I can't believe this beaner is moving up ahead. I can't believe this greasy motherfucker is moving up ahead. This stuttering piece of shit. I wanted the white guy to win. Why did this, He should go back to Mexico. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. But then I realized, you know, it's just those few people. It's not the whole world. Shit, when I went to Pennsylvania, Allentown... The most fucking um, blue collar country I've ever been to. The fucking steel country. Yeah. Dude. Well, they're working here in Allentown. There was a fucking um, old man there who was 60 years old with his wife. And they were wearing sweatshirts that they made in red. And it said Team Felipe Esparza. So take that. This yeah. is my one. Yeah. Well, you're you're being able to travel yeah, the man, country so- to see that, that it's actually, you know... If you go by what you see online, it looks way more divided than it is. I oh, think hell yeah, Brad. Like, put, when you start believing people, oh, man, you went to uh, Birmingham, they gonna understand you. But you asked, but you said something earlier about, about like, like it's white people now. In 2018, the U.S. Census reported that by 2045, America is going to be a minority white country. What would you say to Lies. white No, I'm serious, dude. What would you say? They've never been to Dayton. <laughs> what would you say to white folks uh, who will have to face this for the first time being a minority? Uh, I don't know, man. I say, man, I, I will just start holding on to your Mexican friends, man. <laughs> They're gonna be a, we're going to be a lot of token white people. Yeah, there's gonna be a, you're going to have a lot of token. Do you have any token white friends? No. Why not, man? We're, I have you know, token Asian friends. Who, <laughs> and token uh, Arab friends. 
One of each. That's all you need, man. Just need one to just to mix up the group and recommend good restaurants. I all guess right. I have a, I have a, a white friend. Uh, he's a comic, though. Like, like whenever I go to certain places, like, I know who to call. Yeah. Like, if I'm in Florida, I call the comedian named Adam Murray, you know? He has, long, he has long hair just like me. He's like the white version of me, except I'm funnier. Nah. You know, he's a young comic. Yeah. And then when I go to New York, I call the, the Matt Fultron. Matt's yeah, so dude. Full charge is my go-to is my guy over boy, there. Dude. Then I go to Texas. I got Keith Manning, some black comedian out of Houston. Yeah, he just does corporate gigs. You know, I call him at the right at the last minute. He'll, he'll go anywhere. Oh yeah, man. We just told my wife I'm leaving for two days. Like yeah. that. No questions asked. He'll leave. You know what I mean? Yeah. Reliable people, bro. I need reliable people, bro. I don't. I don't need people who don't know how to how to fucking read a, a ticket. You know, I want people who know how to travel. Who don't who still do their own thing, you know? Don't need to be babied, you know? Yeah. I don't like I don't like a big group. Hey, like if you don't want to hang out and have breakfast with us, that's fine. That's cool. We'll see you at the show. Bring a joint. That goes into Mi Vida. Play the intro, Peter. Very mellow, slow and low, dope reggae song in Spanish, basically translate to my life. And uh, this could either be literal or figuratively referring to someone who means as much as his life. Yeah. Now, this is actually a sad song because it's about loss in real time. So it's, it is literally about the feeling we have of watching our life slip away from us despite our attempts to hold on. Yeah. So it's a pretty deep song. Now, as as you've reached middle age, I'm sure your priorities have changed, but what do you hope to accomplish with your time from here on out? I want to write a bunch of books in a character like Charles Bukowski. Yeah. You know, like we're a, we're a bunch of people. Like I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure like time's going to change, man. People are going to go back to reading books. I want to be out there, man, with at least four, four books, fiction. Yeah. I always wanted to write. I can't write, but I always wanted to write a book. I always wanted to teach too, but that ain't gonna happen. So I want to write a screenplay. You know, even if I don't buy it, I just want to write it. At least accomplish it. You know. Yeah. And uh, read more books. I still want to go to Italy because that was part of my list. You haven't done it yet. Oh. Why don't you in just Olive Garden? Why don't you? I mean, that's it's Italian, I guess. I mean, it's American Italian, but. Uh, well, why don't you guys just plan a trip out there, man? I know, right? I, I funny, like, I'm one of those comics that, well, if I ain't booked there, why should I go? Yeah, dude. It's like, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, I bet if you just, you get you and you and your wife should just take, just take a week off and go there, dude. Like, that's on you. Like, you, you have the money to do son. that now. Well, bring him, too. He's in school. Go in the summer. Sure. I, went to, I went to Italy in the summer. He's going to Dayton for summer. Well, then when he goes Dayton, there, Ohio. then you guys fucking, yeah. you guys take off and go to fucking Italy, dude. There's no excuse for that. That's something you can accomplish 100%. Everything that you said you can accomplish, yeah. but you should have gone to Italy by now. Uh, the next song, Trap by Love. Let's put it on because it's catchy as fuck. <laughs> This has got like a big band feel to it with a little yeah. reggae twist. Uh, I love this song, man. It's it's like a weirdly sad love song. It's sort of a two-part question because this and the next song are both relationship songs with similar music. So this is another one of those songs we were talking about that blends into the next one. Now, this is about a failing relationship. When you come, I feel better. Sky is blue. You say forever. Oh, oh, <coughs> I've been trapped by love. Have you ever been in a failing relationship where you felt like you couldn't or weren't allowed to leave or wouldn't allow yourself to I think, leave? think um, all my relationships were failing. I was dating like five women at one time. Five women? Yeah. Like five, I think. I had one 
she would show up, like, and I'm trying to brag, but I don't know how I got I got caught up like this, you yeah. know, like like I started with too many relationships in one week. Like I guess I met two I met two girls at the same week, but I didn't think that one was gonna call me. So when what when when the other one decided to call me, I was already dating this one, and I didn't end up dating both of them. Really? Like, but yeah, man, and like it, it was before the internet, man, before like. Well, that, that's it. that's easier then because you could do it back then. Yeah. Now, I don't see how you could date multiple people now in the age of social media. It was tough. So did they have? Oh, actually, actually like five was like two. Did <laughs> it's a big difference. <laughs> One was a big girl, so she looked like three girls. Yeah. So, but but uh, did you eventually get caught? No. No. We ended up breaking up like a normal relationship with the, uh, both of them. So, how did you eventually exit those relationships if you were caught up? Man, my, my relationship always ended like b- bad, bro. They just dissolved, bro. Every single one? Like powder, bro. Why? I don't know. I'm not a breaker upper. I just let it disappear, man. I just stop calling, and that's it. You start ghosting them? Yeah. And then that's, well, that's a sign. That's definitely telling somebody, yeah. like, you know, hey, I think it's done. <laughs> you haven't called you in like two weeks. Well, why do you think people search for the perfect love and then settle for what they know isn't right for them? Too much. Reading too many books about love, like Romeo and Juliet, you're fooled by that, man. Like two people are gonna fall in love, then kill each other over love. Come on, man, it's gonna happen. So how do you how do you find perfect love then? You gotta be there, man. You're gonna find it on the internet. You're not gonna find it on a bus. You just gotta be somewhere, man, where it's just two people look at each other, and you're not you're not you're not gonna be afraid to talk to her. Yeah. That's first of all. Because if, you, if you're afraid to talk to her, she ain't yours. She's never going to be yours. Someone else can just swoop in and cock block you. She's way more comfortable, yeah. yeah. If you know it, man, she's comfortable with you, you're comfortable with her, you just click, man. You just know it, you know it that moment. Don't let her go. I love that. That was perfect. Uh, the next song, Le Rendezvous, a.k.a. The Meeting. This is another continuation of the song before it. I don't know why I said continuation like that. Basically, it's the same song, but now our boy wants to make it work with this French lady, but she's cutting him off. And he sings a song in both English and French. Now, we talked about it the first song. What was the hardest breakup you've ever had? What was what was the worst or hardest breakup you've ever had? <coughs> I think when I was caught cheating, I guess. When was that? I don't even remember. A long time ago. Yeah, then we got back together. They didn't work out because she was too hurt. And then I ended up going with the other girl again. Really? Yeah. How'd she catch you cheating? Well, I didn't hang up the phone right. And her sister picked up the other phone and she read all my, she heard all my messages on my home phone. Oh. So then, she, she, so she all, snitched then, you and out? Then, and then she let her, fr- her, 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 her sister listen to it. Oh, wow. And then when I was driving away, she confronted me at a gas station and I said, yeah. And I left. At least you were honest. You know, I'll give you that. Never, never. It wasn't ch- my phone. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> also, I was caught too. Both girls showed up to my house. That's probably a bad one. What? You're leaving that one out too? Yeah. Tell me about that. I don't know how this happened, but in the same situation, you know, they picked up the phone or whatever. The girl called the other girl and then they shared notes, blah, 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 blah. Oh, so they so they both met and they were like, "Well, this is what I got from him," and then she's yeah. like, "This is what I got from him," and, and then, what, and then um, they both showed up to my house. Yeah, but it was crazy, bro. That oh, I can imagine when dude. they both showed up to my house. How, 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 what right was before that? they showed up, some chick that turned me down had just left. Really? Well, she didn't turn me down. You know, we, she came over to my house. We were hanging out, and then she left, and then those two girls showed up. Really. What was that feeling? What were you feeling while that was going on when you saw both of those two girls there? Fucking um, checkmate, homie. <laughs> That's how I said it on stage. Checkmate. Yeah. That's it, man. What are you going to do? What, did, you what didn't did catch you me. I wanted to catch you. you. Did you say anything to them? Like, did you have, did you try to, like, make a lie up or I anything? I trusted both of you. You said you come at me? <laughs> And they, but they had you, man. They, they had, had me you fucking so, dead to rights. So I ended up going, yeah, so that was it, man. That, All that right. Was, that was a tough one. That's a good one. Any others? You keep, for, you keep popping into your head about other ones. That's about it right now. Okay, cool. Let's get into the next one. Mr. Bobby. 
Let's play a little bit of that. Peter, play uh, two minutes, 15 seconds in until it kicks back in, because this is one of the best songs on the record. Hey, Bobby Marley, sing something good to me. Yeah. This world go crazy. It's an emergency. Like you said, uh, because you mentioned Bongo Bong, this song recycles that backing track from that popular song off his last album, Clandestino, and it appears again in a few song called Homans. Omen. Omen. Did I say it wrong? Homan? Yeah, Omen. Uh, Omen. Oh, yeah. She's saying Omen. Yeah, I forgot, like, drop the H. It's like the hombre means man in Spanish, and Omen, I think it must be Portuguese or French for man. So what I found out about him was ever since he was young, Manu Chao had a fascination for reggae and admired Bob Marley. And this song shows his fascination for Bob Marley as he asks him to sing a song to him, almost as if he, he asked his father to sing to him before going to sleep, which is why he talks about dreaming in this song. And Mr. Bobby is almost like a father figure yeah. for Manu Chao. Now, clearly he owes a debt of gratitude to the great Bob Marley. Who, to whom do you owe a similar debt to? Prior man, the first comedian I ever heard that made me want to be a comedian. Yeah, they gave me hope. You know that I, I'm pretty sure that if they, they were not around, maybe I, I would have been something else. But Richard Pryor, George Carlin, Paul Rodriguez, you know, Roddy Dangerfield. Hey, no respect. Who helped you out the most though to get you? Me, really? You didn't have a person that kind of like as they got up higher or was already high. And then well, a lot of people, you know, along the way, you know, you get funny and they hook you up. You were in a program like we talked about called Homeboy Industries run by the highly regarded Father Greg Boyle that helps rehabilitate, educate and reintegrate former gang members and former inmates. Can you elaborate uh, to those that may not know about it or what and what your experiences were like with it? Well, Homeboy Industry it was the organization started by... Um, Father Greg Boyle from the Dolores Mission Church in Boyle Heights. But when I was there, it was it was not called Homeboy Industry. It was called Jobs for the Future. Jobs, not jails. And um, Father Greg will get jobs for con- ex-cons and people who were off drugs. So when I got into it, it was not Homeboy. Um, Father Greg Boyle put me in rehab. He, he, said, he gave me a ride to a rehab, and I stood there for a year, and that was that. So how impactful was that program? Oh, good, man. Good. Cause I, what were they going to do, man? Get shot, you know? Yeah. Do you do anything to pay it forward to others? Oh, yeah. When I won that, when I was on Last Comic Standing, they asked us, what are you going to do with the money if you win? You know, other comedians said, I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to buy this, this, that, that. And I said, well, I'm going to donate my, some of my money to the homeboy industry for helping me out when I was a drug addict. So, yeah, I paid it forward. Do you help out a lot of younger comics? Like how? I don't know. Take them on the road. Oh, yeah. Give I mean, them I, money if they need it. No, nah, I don't give them money, man. But if you're funny, if you're cool, you you know, you, I, I'll come up, man. But you got to be funny, man. You, I got to know you. You know, I don't like people who 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 show up and then they have a guest list when I'm there. I would just want to just want to rip that list, guest list and send this motherfucker back home. Yeah. I want comedians, man, who don't have family everywhere, who I want to get in for free, you know, or. Or um, community who talk too much, you know, like who have ideas, who are going to be doing this. Motherfucker, you're going to be doing that. You wouldn't be here, you yeah. know. I don't like people who talk too much. I want people to just do their set, come back in, smoke a joint, shut the fuck up, you know. Perfect. All right, that goes into Papito. Uh, Peter, play 32 seconds in when they say chongo, chongo, because I almost that? fucking lost it. I papito, I mamita. I fucking love this song, dude. Uh, I almost lost it when he did Yo Chango Chango. E tu Changuito. This is probably the catchiest song on the album, just straight catchy. Uh, any thoughts on it? No, it's a very happy fast song. Very happy fast. I like. I li- that's a perfect way to say it. Happy fast. 
This translates to daddy and sounds like him singing about his daddy and mommy from a child's perspective, which I think is why the music is so upbeat. Now, we talked about you becoming a dad at 18. What is your relationship like with your father and mother? That's good, you know. Um, it's funny, like, um, I grew up with a mom and dad, and um, did you grow up with your mom and dad? I did, yeah, but my dad was a dick to me. Yeah, but you grew up with a mom and dad. I did. He was always there regardless. And have you noticed that the pattern of the women you date with are just women with no dad? Hmm. Now, the the, th- well, the, the two really the, long All my girlfriends? girlfriends I've been with, their dad left. Really? I don't know how it works, but they all left. Like, even the ones I was dating before in the past, their, their dad's gone, like, it's not in the picture. I don't know why it happens in my life. Even my wife, too, her, her dad left when she was little. My girlfriend before that, her dad left. There hasn't been a woman that day that... Women who have both parents, I guess they think differently, I guess. They don't want to be with a guy that has kids, I guess. But um, that's how it worked for me. Yeah. Did So you grew up in a big family, right? Yeah, we were seven of us. Seven kids, two parents. Did you did you ever feel neglected when you grew up in such a big family? Fuck yeah, man! You feel a little neglect, you know, like they pass you on because there's more other kids and need more attention. You're a coup. Yeah. Do you think that led to any like behavioral issues, like of you acting out when you were a kid? Nah, man. When I turned 18 years old, my little brother was born, so they forgot my birthday that day. Really? Yeah. Oh, what did you do? Went to my room and started fell asleep. Okay, that's a good birthday. I mean, good night. Good schluffy, you know, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. All right, this goes into La Chinita. Most likely it's the roach like the joint. Peter, play the intro until the music kicks in because this is short and sweet, just a minute 34 of perfection. <laughs> It's so fucking good, dude. This roughly translates to passing the joint to the brown girl because she wants to dance. Clearly... Manu digs the weed. That's funny. I thought, it was, I thought that he was dancing with a Chinese chick. Really? It could be. Because Chinita is Chinese chick. Really? Like we, we, whenever we say, Mira, esta es mi Chinita, that means this is my little Chinese chick. Esta es my Negrita, that means my little black chick. Esta es mi Güerita, it means my white chick. Keep this in mind, a Jewish guy translated all of this. So there's probably a lot of, of problems. Good job, Morty. Good job, dude. But basically, he's talking about he wants to dance yeah. and get high with the Chinese in the, girl. In the hot, and, in the, in the, and he's telling that black chick to dance, too. So I know you love weed, but you definitely you said you had some substance problems when you were younger. What were they? Oh, man. I used to love crack cocaine. Crack? Fuck yeah. yeah. I bet it's great. And I used to love it as an adult, too. Really? Yeah. I mean, last time I smoked crack was in 2009. 2009? Yeah. How was that, that last crack? Man, it was fucked up, bro. I went through, like, I, I was awake for, like, four days on the road, too, which is a bad idea. Crack on the road's never a good oh, idea. Oh, man, and fuck. Detroit crack? You no, never know. It like, was in you Houston know. crack. <laughs> Hilarity's crack or the like Chuckle Shack crack? It was a Houston, um, Houston um, laptop crack. And, man, I was so fucked up, bro. Like, I was, like, I was doing so much coke. I call up room service because I wanted to make crack, and I ordered from room service um, baking soda and a big spoon. Did they bring it? They brought it. Fuck yeah, dude. That's a good, what was that? That's a good Ramada. <laughs> that Ramada, they're killing the game. Oh, yeah, we know what he's I doing. I fucked up that hotel room that the comedy club lost the hotel account. Really? And next week, they have to put the comedian in a different club. How bad did you, what did hotel. you do to fuck it up? I, mean, I think I burned a whole, I burned a, whole, a little bit of the carpet and, um, Wine all over the carpet, and um, I had a jacuzzi right next to my bed. For some reason, they gave all the comic suites, whether you sold out or not. And I was jumping from the swimming pool, from the jacuzzi to the bed. And then I guess I don't know what happened. I must have been standing on that pipe, and I must have loosened it. 
So when I turned it on the next day, it just flew water everywhere, bro. Like a fountain, dog. <laughs> Yeah. So did you have like a, besides that moment in Houston, like, did you have like this cl- moment of clarity that told you to stop doing crack? No, I guess um, I'm a binge user, man. Like I'm the kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm the most, type, I'm the most, I'm the worst type of person to party with, you know, because I don't do coke every day. Like some people can manage and do coke every day. Yeah. I'm not that person, you know, I'm the one, that, I'm the kind of person that can kill you because I'm a binger, you know. I'm the kind of guy that if I have five, five grand, I'm going to do the whole $2,500. Dude, that's me. It. I'm the exact same way, dude. And um, I, I don't care if you don't have money to do coke. As long as you keep bringing it, you can do coke for free, motherfucker. Yeah. You know, so I'm that type of guy, right? I, I get the party started, bro. Yeah. I make it safe, too. So then what, what got you to stop then? I guess, I don't know. It's just decided, you know, like it's time to stop, get serious. Yeah. No, I get it. I was working on a movie too. Um, I was working on a movie with Paul Rodriguez and Joe Diaz. What was the movie? The Deep, the Deported. <laughs> no, I get it. And it was the Deported, and we got paid well. And I gave some someone my I gave everybody in the in the set of my CD, and then the producer of the movie he wanted to make a movie based on my CD. So um, I didn't believe him. I, kept, I went to go get more fucked up. And we ended up doing a movie, bro. I got my own movie. It came out in 2009. Felipe Esparza, Paul Rodriguez starring as father and son. The poster was me and him. I got it done, bro. They got it done. And then I started thinking about it. Wait a minute, man. I got a lot of shit, I got a lot of shit done in three days, four days, one week of being sober. Yeah. So I decided not to drink no more because that's my problem. If I drink, man, I'm going to want to bump immediately like... Ah, yeah, dude. The same way. I need a little bump, a little chase, a little, just a little, a little, little something, a little reminder. Well, I, but that's the mind tricking you, man. Yeah. You know, because I get tri- like, I, if I'm sober, I get out for bumps, bro. Like, like there's been fans that shake my hand and give me like a twenty. Then they got, then like, um, bro, this is how fucked up it is. I don't have the balls to throw it away. What do you do with it? I give it to somebody who doesn't like coke. You throw it away. Yeah. And I watch them. You watch them <laughs> and throw I watch it that shit. Yeah. I watch that shit make the little circle go in the toilet. Yeah. I, I couldn't imagine. I can't throw it in the trash because I'm going to dig my hand in there later no, on. No, gotta, it's, it's got to go in the toilet because it's got to be destroyed. It's got to be like taken make sure away from you. sure someone else throws it away. Yeah. And you watch them do it. Good for you, man. All right. The next song is La Media, which translates to the tide. And La this Media? shit, yeah, this shit just like kicked in and scared the shit out of me. Let the tide. The first time I heard this song here, let's 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 Peter like play how this kicks in because this shit's intense. <laughs> I mean, that just scares the shit out of you, dude. You're coming off such a laid-back song, and it's like, I mean, that it freaked me the fuck out in the bathtub. It's like an attack. You go yeah. from a chill song to an attack, and I wrote, this is what I wrote. I go, this, I just want to do the lumbada to this motherfucker. Uh, so this means the tide, and I'm not entirely sure, but I think this song is about fucking. Uh, yeah. It also ends with the phrase, nothing lasts forever. All right. What's a fleeting moment between you and the world that you wish could have held on to longer? I don't know, man. I used to have those things a lot. I guess summer camp, you know. I was, t- I was, there was more times in the day sometimes. You know, you get older and you, know, you, you get busy in your career and then you realize that when, when back in the day when, you, when I was doing open mic, those were probably my funner days. I laughed more. You know, I saw a movie once, man, that reminded me of, about this question. Um, it was called Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. I know that movie, The yeah. movie came out in 2001 and shit, I think during 9-11, so it didn't get much play. And it's um, Andy Garcia, 
and um, Radio Rahim from fucking um, Do the Right Thing. Do the Right Thing. And um, Christopher Walken had just put a hit on him, and the hit was Buckwheats. The b- Buckwheat means that um, they put a, a twenty five, a twenty two bullet up your ass, and it's, he, he and the guy who shoots you, he waits for you to bleed out your ass till you die. So he probably like pumped two bullets up your ass, you know. So the guy tells him, hey, he's he's telling him that um, he, they he's not scared of dying. But then he says, hey, Jimmy, remember we were little kids and when, and we were waiting for summer vacation and then summer vacation will come by so fast and then it'll just fucking leave and summer vacation is gone? It goes, that's how it goes, life has a way of passing you by faster than any summer vacation. So, yeah, man, I wish you could take back those good times, you know. I wish it would have last longer. I wish you would take a photo or something. So you'd want to stay in your childhood when you were in no, summer camp? No, I wish it would have. Right? I would have wish it would have last longer. I, I like where I'm at right now. This is the best time of my life right now. Yeah, like when I think back when I'm seventy, you know, life gets better for me, man. I think I'm living the best time of my life right now. I'm mature, you know. No crack. No crack. You know, I don't. I don't have no debt. I don't want nobody shit. Yeah. Nobody owes me anything either. Good. Uh la. Would you call it? It was uh, old man's. Old man. Oh man! This is a song, man. It's about a woman who's describing what, what what kind of what type of man she wants. You know, she wants yeah. a man with a character. She don't care if he's black. He don't care if he's Chinese. He don't. But but he don't want the man to be an egoistic piece of shit or yeah. or, or, a, or a guy that abuses women. But you have to be, have to be cute, and she wants you to have a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. It's actually what I wrote. She wants you to have a cell phone. I love the I love the lyrics of the song. It's probably the, my favorite song in the whole album because I don't know. I really don't know what the fuck she's saying, but it's so poetic, man. I want to play the song really, really loud. I, I I have gone up on stage. I've been introduced, and that's been the song that I go up to. This yeah. one and um, Kiora song and yeah, that song. Peter, play a little bit of this song, play it, dude. Omen. Top it up, you know, put up, I don't just don't you know omen. Homens, gosto de tudo, dos morenos, dos mulatos, dos branquinhos, dos loirinhos, dos loirinhos e dos crioulos. Porque só tem que ser homem. É. Tem homem corno, homem baixo, homem gordo, homem grato, safado, careca, cabeludo, viado, ousado, tem muito, tem muito, tem muito, tem muito homem. Pois é. What's strange about this is that Manu said that he originally composed this track for this song. It's a woman singing, right? Yeah, but he yeah. composed this song specifically uh, when he composed this track, but it wasn't released until this record a few years ago. Let me ask you, what from your past have you ignored only to have it resurface years later and demand to be dealt with? Oh, man, when I was, um, when I was a little kid, well, when I had those two kids, man, I never played child support. I ignore that shit, bro. I like, I didn't ignore, ignore it, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't think it was gonna come back and bite me in the ass later. When I won last comic standing, I won um two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the next day, their mom filed for child support and she ended up winning, bro. I wrote her a fat ass check for a hundred forty thousand dollars cash free, tax free. I hope you still have it. <laughs> that's, that's I hope you spent ten thousand dollars a year. That's definitely something that came back to bite you in the ass, dude. That is fucking hysterical. Hey, but I'm good. The day after. The day after. They didn't fucking. NBC called me up and said, well, such and such. And I said, let me tell you, man. Let me just see my options here. Then um, I, inc- I incorporated myself. I started Felipe'sWorld.com. Felipe's World Inc. I get paid through that corporation. So um, I made them. Write the check out to Felipe's World Incorporation. That way the, the county can't come get it no more because, hey, you're going out to Felipe Esparza, not Felipe's World Incorporated. Yeah. So I waited a while, and then I wrote them the check good. out of Felipe's World. It's still good, though. I mean, like, yeah, they're, it's they're definitely, paid. They're, they're paid. They can't, you know, the, the kids deserve. She she put up with a lot. and She didn't even tell the kid that she got that cash. She didn't? No, I found out from my daughter one day, and she goes, no, your mom got paid. She didn't even tell us. Wow. She probably told her girlfriend then. 
Oh, that's fucked up, dude. You yeah. should sue. You should sue that, or you should at least bring that up to the child support services. It's over, man. It's over. I guess you're right. Yeah, don't live in the past. That's what we were talking about earlier. The past kills you. All right, then. Then it goes into probably my favorite song on the record, La Voca Loca. Did I say that right? La Vaca Loca. Oh, La Vaca Loca. I love that song. I, I was so close. Yeah, you didn't even want to correct me. It translates to the crazy cow, and it implies the terminal dance that we all do. So Manu wrote this song after a breakup, and he found himself depressed and suicidal in Rio. And then a cow walked into the bar he was drinking in, and he says he was saved by the tranquility of the cow's eyes. His tour jacket has pictures of cow's eyes on it, and he says he understands why they worship cows in India, where he hopes to tour soon. Uh, What's a moment in your life where you received a meaningful message or a sign that you, you hadn't been searching for? Oh, I was watching this documentary of these turtles, well, about the earth. Yeah. And then, like, um, and I'm thinking, and then, like, um, these turtles, right? They've been going to this, this country, right? For before humans, right? And they're big turtles. Ouch. They're those big turtles. I guess sea turtles. And they've been migrating to this town, like, forever. They go there and lay eggs. And at nighttime, they follow the moon, you know? And they go back in the ocean. But a lot of those turtles, because there's there's people living there now, and they keep the lights on at night, so the tur- some of those turtles get confused and go into the city instead of going into the the, the ocean, so they get trampled on and they're gonna then they're, they're not gonna find the ocean anymore because they're already they're already in the fucking city. Yeah. Because they're following the wrong light. So I I thought about it. Fuck, okay. we're fucked up people, man. I mean, we, we we don't even think about it that everywhere a human being has touched his fucking ha- foot has fucked shit over, you know. Yeah. Not even now. Uh, I guess now I know when you go to these you go to these places that are like um, they don't let you feed the animals, they don't let you bring no food, and I always wonder why, 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 why. And I realize because you know you're gonna change the whole ecosystem. Like these turtles, man. It's funny, man. They're like these hundreds of turtles. And people are just kicking them out of the way, you know. And, and there's like these people now who try to go p- pick them up as much as they can and take them back into the ocean. But it's weird, man. Like it's kind of sad in a way. Is that what is that what got you to be vegan? No, nah. you're, you're you're vegan. You've been vegan for how long? Since um, 2011. 2011. Did you have a vegan like well, moment I was, of like? I read a book called uh, "The Omnivore's Dilemma." Yeah. And it was a uh, basically this guy wrote a book, and. He followed an egg to where it was born, where the chicken came out. Then he followed that chicken all the way to somebody's house where they ate it. How much it traveled, yeah. how much gas it was spent, how much water it was spent, you know. Pretty much how much it cost to actually bring a chicken to someone's home. But what happened, got me into uh, being a vegan was I was on an Atkins diet. The Atkins diet, which is now being replaced by the keto diet, which is the same shit. Keto. Are you in ketos? Yeah, I was in oh, ketosis. I'm in ketosis right now. I'm in ketosis. I'm, and the I'm, fucking, I'm in, it was called the Atkins diet, I'm bitch. totally ketosis. Same shit, bro. You know, Atkins diet is the same fucking diet that these people are pushing now. And we, I had the same strips. You pee them. They were called ketosis strips. Yeah. You know, when you're in that level, you're losing weight. But, you, but I was doing it wrong. I was drinking a bunch of Diet Cokes, no water, <laughs> a bunch of cheese, yeah. no bread, no lettuce. Just beef, bro. I would go eat a fucking hamburger with lettuce, with le- wrapped lettuce, with lettuce. Right? Yeah, throw the lettuce like, out. Yeah, and uh, fucking eat the whole hamburger. But I would get eat in and out, four by four, bro. The fucking like eight pieces of cheese, four patties, fucking everything but the lettuce. So I was constipated. So finally, I went to La Mas class to use the restroom. Now, so I was constipated, man, and I got like a hemorrhoid, and I said, "Fuck this." Vegan, softer food, and that's it. And that's yeah. that's 2011. Oh, they worried about the animals then. You so know? it has nothing to do with the with the animal rights. It was just do you ever, Have you cheated? No, you haven't cheated since 2011. No, maybe maybe somebody gave me a cookie that had an egg in it, but that was it. 
All right. So before Last Comic Standing, like we talked about, uh, you were on that show, K Locos. Yes. Am I saying it right? Yeah, George Lopez hosted it. On Galavision. Yeah, man. Uh, and the show introduced- 10 o'clock on Sundays. 10 o'clock on Sundays. The show also introduced fellow uh, comics such as George Lopez, Gabriel Iglesias, Willie Barsena. As a Latino comic, how are you cautious on stage? Or a comic of color, how are you cautious on stage? You well, just, I'm not really cautious no more. Yeah. I, I pretty much say what I want. You know, it's just like, you, you just need experience, man, on how to say things. Yeah. Like, I, I don't get political. I, I just see, like, both ways. Like, I have a joke where I say, they say that immigrants do jobs that white people don't want to do. And I would say, well, I, I guess I'm white because I don't want to do that shit either. And I just think it's a big laugh. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking sides, but it's still political. But I'm just saying the absurdity of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I'm pretty much saying, you know, we're all lazy in a way. You know, we, we all don't want to work. Some people are hard workers, some not. No, I agree. All right, the final song on the record, Infinita Tristanza, which translates to infinite sadness. And this is, really isn't a song. Uh, it's more of a layered sound collage than a song. Over the backing track of La Primavera, there's various men giving speeches about leaving Earth for the cosmos. And what it sounds like to me is like answering machine messages or some sort of like running train station or bus station announcements that have yeah. played throughout the record. And there's also dialogue from this sex ed film from an elementary school biology class. Uh, it's a real trip, man. It kind of ties the whole record together, in my opinion. It yeah. doesn't even have Manu singing on it. And although it ends with the phrase, Next Station, Avenue of Peace, the title translates to Infinite Sadness. Uh, on a record which translates to Next Station Hope, because that's what the title stands for, there has to be all this like personal joy and exuberance mixed throughout it. And it seems a bit odd to leave the listener something this distant and heavy and kind of even out of all this happiness it just it just seems like a weird way to end it so with with us being comics and i knew this that so many of us are in darkness are you a positive person or are you dealing with depression a lot i'm, I'm pretty much positive man. i'm a cool dude how do you stay positive i don't know i just stay positive man like you know i try to find the good in people you know even the bad people I avoid people who are negative, you know, if, if you're negative, you know, you pretty much know, man, I don't, I don't call you back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, dig it. All right, you want to do some facts? Me facts. Me, come on, let's do facts. Manu's parents emigrated to Paris to avoid Francisco Franco's dictatorship. In Spain, right? Yeah. Franco's grandmother had El been Duce. sentenced to death. Shortly after Manu's birth, the Chow family moved to the outskirts of Paris, of Paris. How has the immigrant experience shaped your perspective of your parents and their decisions? I don't know, man. We've been living in the same neighborhood our whole lives. And um, I guess um, during the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president, yeah, um, that's when we got our papers together. And my parents were very responsible. They, got, they saved up their money. They got lawyers. We went to Mexico and we took our, we got our green cards and we been, my, my dad and mom are American citizens now. I'm not, but they are. They went through the whole process, you know, my dad's American citizen. But if you're married to an American, how are you not American? I, I don't know how that works. I only watch in the movies, bro. And um, my dad even, here's something people don't know. Little fact, my dad took his citizenship class in Spanish. <laughs> he took the test in Spanish. Yeah, dude. He, he studied in Spanish. All the questions for him were, were done in Spanish. Because when you're in America for 25 years, you could take the American citizenship cl class in your own tongue. Arabic, Japanese, Korean, Italian, Spain, whatever language it is. If it falls under what, the language they have, you could take it in your own language. Nice. Uh, here we go. Let's so go. your American citizen, Dad? See. <laughs> all right two more and then we're getting you out of here i just want to talk about this one i don't have a question about it 
Manu has arranged some of the zaniest tours in pop history. One involved going by boat round all the parts of South America, but this, the most extreme was when he hired a train to tour war-torn Colombia in 1992, filling it with a ragtag group of circus artists, punks and hippies, playing to peasants, gorillas, and narco trafficantes. Uh, let me ask you this. What's the craziest tour you've ever been on? Um, I think with I was I was touring with Mike Epps. That was a crazy ass tour. Why? And then uh, cause the, he's um crazy. He's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> we, we were in a tour. We did a crazy ass show in um Detroit, and he brought a kangaroo on stage. He brought a kangaroo on stage. Where do you get that? There was a guy there who owns a uh, uh, I guess he owns animals, and he hires them for birthday parties. He had an ostrich, a chimpanzee. He had like two kangaroos, and that fool wanted to. He brought them on stage, and they, and they were dancing with the kangaroos. Kangaroo went crazy. The next day, um, Peter got pissed off at Mike, and Mike had to write him a check because Peter's a piece of. They're a bunch of pussies. Yeah, you know they just want money. They don't give a fuck about nobody, nothing. You know, yeah. and they ain't feeding no hungry kids, no fucking vegan food. They're just cashing checks. Fuck Peter, and um. And so he wrote them a check, and that's it. They, they back it off. You know how they do with bully people to fucking write checks. All right. Manu Chow believes that our world lacks spaces for collective therapy and describes his concerts as small, temporary spaces where people of different backgrounds can come together. What kind of impact do you wish to leave on your audiences after a show? What do you want them to walk away with the most? <coughs> I want them to walk away with merch, bro. Please buy the merch. <laughs> you know, it. I made your ass laugh for an hour. The least you could do is buy a t-shirt. I love you. You know, save some tips for me, too. Yeah, dude. Fucking buy his goddamn, you know. You know what I mean? What's up, fool? Buy the what's up, fool t-shirt. Yeah, man. I know you're going to go home repeating my jokes. You know, some of you young comics out there are... In the back, writing my jokes down. At least buy a T-shirt, bro. They can just say when they tell me, "Felipe, that open micro guy from fucking Trevor Port, Iowa, just did your joke." Yeah, it's cool, bro. He bought a T-shirt. That was the perfect way to end this, dude. Thank you so much for taking Thank the time. Thank you, man. Out what's to... up, fool? What's up, fool? Tell Peter what's up, fool. What's up, Peter? What's up, fool? All right. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Par cementerio se va, inocente condena. Par cementerio se va, la banda la na 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 na. The bed up be do do, pa pa pi pa di do do. God, I love that fucking album, man. What a great album. What a great guest. For all things Felipe, go to his website, felipesworld.com. Funny Felipe on Twitter. Felipe Esparza Comedian on Instagram. Listen to his podcast, What's Up, Fool. Watch his HBO special, Translate This, on HBO Go. And get the album on iTunes or Spotify. And guys, Felipe is on the road. He's constantly on the road. Go to felipesworld.com so you can find out when he is coming to your city. I'll be posting his mixtape track listing link. For all things 500, go to the 500 website, guys, the 500 podcastcom Email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com and follow me on social media everywhere at Josh Adam Myers. May 13th, the goddamn comedy jam at the Roxy, like I said at the beginning. We got Bill Burr, Maj Jabrani, Jeff Ross, Jackie Tone, Joe Sib. It's going to be great. Go to the Roxy's website for tickets, guys. Please subscribe to the 500 guys on whichever way you listen to podcasts. Spotify, go to Spotify. I like their, like their whole browser, whatever they're doing. I like it. Rate and review. If you're on Apple iTunes, review. Dude, all you got to write is 500s of the shit, and then that's it. Give it five stars. Don't forget, we have a Patreon, the 500 Club. Get the podcast a day early on Record Store Tuesdays. Also, we're giving away free merch to members only and extra long podcast episodes. We tape for a while. We cut it down, put it out to you guys for free. If you want the fully, you got to pay for it because it's awesome. You got to pay for all the shit that I got. I got to buy a lack of food, man. 
Join the movement. The 500 Club is a shit. Do it, guys. The500podcast.com backslash club for all details on Patreon membership and options to support The 500. Follow my writer, DJ Morty Coyle, on all social media. Check out his Instagram page with him and his daughter singing a lot of songs. It's adorable. At B and Daddy Cartoons. Also, he's got Yid Nation podcast. Do that. Now, we just listened to Manu Chow from 2001. Now, here is an artist that is directly influenced by this album. From London, we have Vic Tizzle with his song, Oshi Gan Gan. If you're in a band and you're directly influenced by one of these albums or artists and you want your music featured on the 500, send your song to 500podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you put the album and artist that influenced you in the subject. Next week is The Smiths Week with their 1984 self-titled debut album, The Smiths. So y'all got some homework to do. I love you, Fleece Army. Stay as fleecy as possible to all my fleecers. Peace, guys. We gonna make it one day. Oh, she gone, gone. Gone, gone. Oh, she gone, gone. Gone, gone. Oh, she gone, gone. Gone, gone. Oh, she Minute, my baby, kick back for a minute, my lady. I know not everything is all gravy. Baby, you there down for me when I go crazy. So today I sing la la la. I dey hustle for your ring la la la. No girl can take your throne. Cause to the table you dey bring la la la. Yeah, you right for me, and I right for you. You got life with me, me I got life with. You spend time on me, I spend my time on you, 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 na, na, na. Ain't nobody gonna love me like you, I ain't got no money. I'm overdue on rent, but you go there, my honey. You go with me to the end. I ain't got no car, can't take you out on this. But I swear, my baby, we gonna make it one day. See you.